I think Chinese stand-made media products has been framed in no way um, on the quill. So if you search just the Chinese uh, media product, it will come up with everything else. But unless you're really deep into it, Chen Qingling Untamed or The Garden will pop up. I think that's something that does limit the audience what you pop into. But because the Korean media products like Squid Game has been so popular, like even you don't really into Korean culture in UK, um, you get know about because the media talk about it. There's a lot of publicity about it. So it will be pushed to the front page and you know what is that and you watch it and then you get hooked into it. Um, but actually in fandom, especially in transnational Danmei fandom, Chinese Danmei, where it's very, very popular. Um, I think that's something that going back to what Jenkins was saying, um, it's really hard to know how this will lead to any geopolitical changes. Partly, I think it will bring changes because uh, at least uh, it uh, expands the queer media text on the global market because before you see a lot of Japanese that may work. You see a lot of um, Malaysia, Philippines that may work. But you don't see so much about Chinese. And Chinese that may does have a specific culture um, characteristic and the subtleness conveying the, the homo erotic design. Um, and that does make people feel it's interesting and they want to know more. I think, as I said, um, kind of emphasize in my talk is it, it, it has the potential to, to change the dominance um, by you know, the, the Anglophone queer media text and also the previously the Japanese dominated Dami fandom. And we see that it overlaps a lot with the uh, fam slash. Uh, it overlaps with uh, um, the previous Japanese boys' love. So potentially well cost change, but because as um, we all know, the original Chinese Dame media product has been adapted to past censorship. Therefore, a lot of things has been erased. It's unless you read the novel by yourself, you know the original story, you know the queer subline underneath, then you read this or you watch the, the Dame media text, you, you know what's going on. Otherwise, you don't pick up necessarily. So I think that for mainstream audience, it is actually hard to make that connection, to see that why this will affect LGBT um, in a way that we think it will. <laughs> so that, as I was thinking that, um, yes, we don't know what kind of geopolitical change will make, but um, because right now what we see the Dame work has been taken out of the Chinese context in the production in, in terms of distribution. So they are targeting global audience right now. And that potentially this way again will affect how those Dame work is going to be produced. Um, we don't know the future and I don't know how they're going to affect Chinese Dame subculture itself because we know there's a lot of limitations right now in China. Um, but I do think there's more potentials there because because there's more work by fans <laughs> because there's also um, the kind of wellness that may fandom is more diversified than before and it has been starting to um, intersect with for example the, the Thai that may culture and Malaysia that may culture their representation of LGBT identity are far more direct and explicit so potentially that all this kind of together will have an impact, I would say so. So it looks like there are two questions online. Should we try to get to those? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The question about uh, top mark. Uh, yeah, so there's one above that about that asks, how do, uh, apart from learning the language yourself, how mm -hmm. do you overcome the language gaps while doing transcultural ethnography. Yeah. And the gamble I'm taking is the best way to do it is large scale collaborative uh, comparative teams where we learn from each other and we tap those people's language skills who have access the source materials we don't have access to in the US. So that's what our research methodology is. 
and how I'm starting to overcome my initial resistance to writing about a culture other than my own, which as an American, we love to drop out of an airplane and write the next day everything about someone else's culture. I don't want to do that. And I don't know Chinese culture as well as my own. And I'm sort of grab, struck with a handful of exemplars that I can look at. But when I'm in a group where we can compare notes with scholars based in China and Korea, Japan, Thailand, and so forth, we're in a different relationship there that does allow us to get there. And I don't have any of the languages, I'm afraid. And at this age, the age I'm at now, I'm not planning to try to tackle learning difficult languages, right, to do my work. I just want to facilitate and show, be a leader and help. I know things about research processes. I know how to mentor good scholars, and I want to amplify the voices of scholars across Asia and Asian American scholars in the U.S. so that we hear those voices better than we've seen it before. Now, in terms of the Pop Mart question, yes, I think part of what interests me about Pop Mart is in the West, toy media-related toys tend to be targeting young men. And here, the dominant market, by all accounts for Pop Mart, are women in their 20s. And I think there's different, the result is a different subject matter, a different aesthetics, and a kind of sensuality to those toys that's very, very different than the action figures we know from Japan or the United States or whatnot. And I think the other thing is that American action figures now, the expensive ones have maybe 20 points of articulation, right? They're designed to mend and move. The, you know, Pop Mart action toys have four or five at most, probably less than that. So I think they're not action figures, they're contemplation figures. They're things you sit, on your desk or your you know cubicle and you take a moment during the workday and you want your mind wanders and you fantasize about seeing somewhere else and so the fantasy comes from the user the owner of the toy not mapped onto an ever more specific action figure for every scene of every every cult film that we're in, involved with and i think that's a really interesting thing the other thing I was going to say is I'm fascinated by the degree to which Molly, say, is engaged in cosplay. She is always essentially Molly, but she wears costumes from other characters. I've been collecting the WB series of Molly action figures where she's dressed like Tom and Jerry or Batman or whatnot. So she can be simultaneously at core Chinese and connect in global ways to pop culture from elsewhere. And that layering of identity is part of what really fascinates me about these, these toys. So before we break up, I wanted to say, if any of you are interested in participating in our network, reach out to us. Uh, it's hjenkins at usc.edu. And because we're always looking for people, you know, new participants, uh, not just Chinese, but Thai, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese, Korean. And I will be t running a summer school next year in partially in Japan, partially in Korea to study transcultural fandom and global pop culture. So um, if you're interested in that, reach out to me by email as well. Yes, yes. If you are interested, please write to uh, Henry to join the research group. And I think uh, we are close to the end of the seminar. Let us thank our speakers, especially Henry Santiga, Dr. Koting, and Thank you so much. Hmm.